In our second set of notes in our unit six on learning, we're going to extend classical conditioning. So we've kind of already talked about the basics and understanding how it's naturally eliciting stimuli and responses and making associations in the acquisition phase. But now let's kind of build on that and talk a little bit more. J.B. Watson is a huge name of our course and of the field that you really have to know, and you gotta know it like the back of your hand. It's kind of like um, the Freud of behaviorism, right? Like you have to know Freud with psychoanalysis, you gotta know Watson with behaviorism. So his psychological bio, 1908, he was 30, he was named a chair of the psychology department at Johns Hopkins University. Um, in 1913, he ushered in the era of behaviorism in psychology. He wrote um, in three sentences what became known as the behaviorist manifesto. One being psychology's content should be behavior, nothing else, not cognition, nothing internal. Two, its method should be objective rather than introspective. Objective meaning almost more scientific, more documented and introspective being looking inward, more subjective, meaning it's the individual's, not the individual's take on what's going on, but looking inward and how do you make that objective? You can't. And then its goal should be the prediction and control of behavior rather than the understanding of mental events. He's essentially saying that anything internal and the mental processes don't matter it's the behavior, it's the external behavior that's going on. Um, showing behaviorism's popularity, Watson was elected the American Psychological Association president in 1915. So he moved up quickly. So J.B. Watson did an experiment with his assistant, assistant Rayner um, called the little, well, we call it the Little Albert experiment. And what he did is he took children, okay, infants, babies, um, and he conditioned them. He wanted to condition fear into these children. And uh, that's so sad, right? But here's a story you got to know what happened. He took an 11 month old baby named Little Albert, and I'll tell you why we call it the Little Albert experiment and why we focus on this one child of the many that he actually experimented on. He rang a gong the unconditioned stimulus. And imagine a baby hearing a big loud noise like that. Like um, the other day with my 12 month old, we were at like Target or something in the potty with my two year old who was going potty. And my 11 month old reaches, or I'm sorry, 12 month old reaches up and flushes it and it's super loud and he freaks out, right? Like, so obviously it's an unconditioned stimulus. It naturally elicits the unconditioned response of fear and crying, right? The neutral stimulus down here is just a little white mouse, okay? That does not elicit, although it might make like an elephant scared, haha, -ha, or, you know, some people are like, ew, rat, mouse, yucky. But to a baby who doesn't know better, it's not scary. So it's a neutral stimulus, there is no response. So how did he condition them? He would show the mouse, ring the gong which would make them scared, right? That's the unconditioned response. And he would do that over and over again. Remember, and I'm gonna circle it here with my little cursor, remember that this phase up at the top is acquisition. You can label that on your paper. This is the stage of acquisition where association between the stimuli are being made, between the neutral stimulus and the unconditioned stimulus that elicits the unconditioned response. So in order to know that the babies were conditioned, they had to not make the loud, scary noise. So they only presented the mouse, and if they responded, ta-da, conditioning happened, success. So the rat, or the, I'm sorry, the white mouse is the conditioned stimulus, causing the learned, conditioned response of fear. It only took seven trials for little Albert to respond to the rat. Watson and Rainer would strengthen the response every five or so day, f five or so days by reintroducing the unconditioned stimulus of the loud noise. Okay, so they're strengthening that response by reintroducing the unconditioned stimulus um, and allowing for extinction to not occur. It's, it's, it's um, avoiding extinction. So what happened to little Albert? Um, here's the thing, he moved away before Watson could uncondition the fear. 
okay? So that's why we call this a little Albert experience experiment because we're so curious on, oh, I wonder what happened to little Albert. Like how influential is conditioning if you're unable to bring the subject back to normal, which was to not be conditioned to the white mouse. So Albert did generalize his fear of the white rat to other furry fuzzy items like Santa's beard and a fur coat, and they realized this before he left. So then his family moves away and they couldn't uncondition the fear. But most psychologists agree that more than likely, little Albert did not remain afraid of furry things. Why? This is my question to you. Why did little Albert probably most likely, and the psychologists agree, not remain afraid of furry things? Because of extinction. Think of the definition of extinction and I'll bring you back to this slide. I'm gonna circle the second kind of row here. If all they're doing is presenting the CS, which is the white mouse, and not re-strengthening the association with the loud noise, eventually the response will go away. Just like if you only ring the bell at a dog and never present them food, eventually the response will go away. It's the same process. So in real life, right, um, he's not going to hear a loud noise, baby little Albert, every time he sees something white and furry. So yes, eventually it's going to go away. So let's talk about the fall and rise of Watson. Shortly after his experiment with little Albert, Watson became romantically involved with his assistant, Rosalie Rayner, um, and that behavior was not tolerated because he was married, which would kind of insinuate that it's now tolerated, and it's not really. Just a little more taboo back then and that people lost their jobs because of it. So he was forced to retire from research in psychology in 1930. He um, was employed with the J. Walter Thompson Advertising Agency where he used techniques from his behavioral psych background, like with little Albert, to sell products. And this is where he made like an ever-changing mark, not just in the psychology world, but in everywhere. He showed that people's preferences between rival products were not based on their sensory qualities, but on their associations. So if you prefer Starbucks over Dunkin' Donuts or vice versa, it's because of the associations being made. He went on to develop some of Thompson's most successful campaigns like Maxwell House Coffee, utilizing and popularizing the idea of a coffee break and that if a coffee break is necessary, you're drinking more coffee. Um, Pond's cold cream using testimonials from the queens of Romania and Spain being absolutely beautiful women but also queens, right? So if we gals are making associations like, ooh, I want to look like her, I want to be like the queen. And then Johnson's baby powder convincing mothers to use the powder after every single diaper change. And that um, maybe even making an illusory correlation or association with it has an effect. In 1958, the APA awarded Watson with its gold medal for his contributions to psychology. So what has Watson's research taught us? Some counseling techniques, which we're going to talk about a long time from now in unit 12 and 13. Um, but one being counter conditioning. So not just conditioning, but counter conditioning for phobias and other anxiety disorders. Teaching the patients to respond in a relaxed manner to the conditioned stimulus until eventually the response goes extinct. Okay, so counter conditioning is, let's say you have a phobia of snakes, rather than um, responding with the anxiety, you teach relaxing states and associating that with what normally induces the anxiety. And taste aversions. You avoid a particular food because of an unpleasant experience with that food. It can occur after a significant delay, unlike most cases of classical conditioning. So let's say you eat something for dinner one night and you don't get sick until the next day. That's a rather long time between the neutral and unconditioned stimulus, right? So, um, but we humans are more complicated. We can kind of make that connection. But the idea is with a taste aversion is we're probably not going to want to eat that stuff ever again. In fact, even thinking about it makes us cringe, right? 